since the Thank you very much, Alex. Uh, so this is a series of webinars that we have been holding since uh, September last year. It's called the Future of Work webinar series. What we've been doing is we've been hearing from various different people around the world uh, about the challenges of the future of work and what it means for their, for their particular part of the world, understanding that there may be different challenges uh, depending on the, on the technological sophistication and the makeup of the population. Um, and those types of things to, to, to get the differential experiences of what the future of work might be, and also to look at the challenges where, which it comes from human factors and ergonomics. And today, uh, the webinar is, uh, is going to be from, we're calling it Central Europe, but both our speakers are, are from Germany, which of course is from Central Europe. And I'm very pleased to be able to introduce you to um, the two women who will be presenting today, um, I think that's, uh, for, for me, that's quite important that, uh, that women are, are very much part of this dialogue. So I'm very pleased that, that we have two women presenting here today. And that is Anita Titch and uh, Verena Nitsch. Um, and I will introduce them from, I'll introduce them at the beginning and then they, they, will, they will then uh, give their presentation. So Anita is the head of division of the Changing World of Work at the Federal Institute of Occupational Safety and Health in Germany. And she's also a professor for digitalization and ethics at the University of bonn rhein sieg also in Germany. Um, she is responsible for monitoring and researching the health and social effects of the organizational and technological changes in the world of work, um, which is going to be a prominent theme of what she'll be talking about today. Verena is the director of the Institute for Industrial Engineering and Ergonomics at Aachen University in Germany, so the RWTH Aachen University. She's also a head of Department of Product and Process Ergonomics at the Fraunhofer Institute of Communication, Information Processing and Ergonomics. She, her background's in organizational psychology, which I'm quite interested to see. I'm, I'm an organizational psychologist also uh, by training. Uh, and that's uh, sparked interest in human machine interaction. Uh, she previously worked at the Bundeswehr University in Munich, um, and she completed a doctorate in engineering and was a prof assistant professor in cognitive ergonomics before becoming a full professor at Aachen. So without further ado, and without listening to me for any, any further period of time, I'm going to hand over to Anita, who's going to kick us off today. I'm going to switch my camera and, uh, and, and mic off. Thank you very much, Andrew, for the nice introduction. I am giving you... So you should see my screen right now, and I start. Um, well, I got already the nice introduction, so I can make this very briefly here. Um, I'm Anita Tisch. I'm the head of division Changing World of Work at the Federal Institute for Occupational Safety and Health in Germany. The Federal Institute is a ministerial research institution. That means that we are funded by the German um, Ministry of Labor and Social Affairs. However, we, can, uh, our, we are independent in doing our research agenda and of course our research results. Our main aim is to promote occupational safety and health and humane work design. And I am a social scientist by training, so I might be a little bit of an outsider here in the human factors and economic, uh, economics um, community, but I hope I can give you a few insights um, and a few points to discuss later on um, of our work. My division um, comprises seven research groups and our main task is to monitor or try to identify evolving trends in the world of work. We do this by relying on big survey data. For example, we conduct um, the Bauer working time survey, a panel survey we conduct every two years, but also different other large representative surveys. And we also comprise a very large um, amount of different topics from working time, for example, digitalization, but also the German minimum wage. 
I don't want to get uh, into much detail about the industry 4.0 debate because I have a feeling that Verena is talking about, about, about that in more detail. But um, when we talk about the future of work, the German debate was long um, summarized by the term industry 4.0. And I think everybody in the whole world um, kind of um, connects the term industry 4.0 with Germany. Industry 4.0 is the result of an almost 200 year old long technological transformation which started in the uh, 19th century with the introduction of hydro and steam power and industry one. It was followed by industry two, which kind of can be described as the era of mass production in the US. It started with front with Ford's moving assembly lines and everything was possible because of the invention of electrical energy. Then the transformation became faster and faster and it was in it can be um, described as industry 3.0 where electronics and IT um, played a main role and which led to a further automatization of a production in the production industry. And finally, in the um, early 2000s, um, cyber physical systems became um, most current and people as well as things were connected through internet and uh, it was most important, the introduction uh, of uh, the implementation of VLAN. So this is where we are heading right now. But when we look at the debate of the last 10 years in Germany, the term kind of changed and it changed from industry 4.0 to work 4.0. We had a big um, debate, uh, expert debate in Germany a few years ago, um, which was called Work 4.0. And within this debate, four mega trends and drivers of the transformation were identified. One is digitalization, another is the ongoing globalization. We can might be able to discuss about that a little bit further after COVID. Another um, big trend is the demographic change we are facing in Germany. The German um, working population is aging dramatically and our baby boomers are the, the biggest part of the German employees and which has had also impact on the future labor supply. And finally, another um, mega trend which was discussed is the cultural change. Of course, these changes are interacting with each other. And what I want to talk about today is especially be about the trend of digitalization and its impact on the cultural change. When we talk about the digital transformation, the debate or the public debate in Germany was um, determined by a fear of massive job loss. This was kind of uh, introduced by the study of Ray Osborne in the US, everybody might know, who predicted that um, within 10 and tw or 20 years, the, about half of the jobs of the US labor market are replaced by machines. Now we have 10 years later, and um, I think the US labor market is better off than 10 years ago, but um, um, already 10 years ago, also in Germany, um, this fear was very big and highly discussed. And it was asked whether these numbers are transferable to Germany. There were two big studies um, done um, who predicted uh, kind of more promising um, numbers. For example, Bonin and his colleagues um, predicted that about 12% of the jobs in Germany um, have an activity or task profile with high, a higher probability of automatization. And Katharina Dengler and Britta Mattes have about a, predicted a pretty um, similar number. They predicted that about 15% of the employees work in jobs where large parts of these activities can already potentially be performed by machines. This means they don't have to be performed by machines, but it is um, from a technological point of view possible. However, even back then, um, a few uh, researchers also predicted that although we might lose a, 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 a significant number of workplaces or job, also technological change and digitalization will create about the same number of jobs, uh, new jobs. And um, this was our starting point in a big program we did at our federal institute. 
And we, are, we said that, well, well, if it's not the job, if it's not the occupation, then maybe we have to look a little bit deeper. We have to go one, one level deeper and look at the tasks, the activities people are doing in their occupations. What we found is that the OECD Employment Outlook in 2017, um, an interesting study, they um, showed that the proportion of occupations which are at risk due to digitalization. And the red bars here um, comprise occupations that will change significantly. Hence, they will not, uh, they will not um, 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 disappear, but they will change significantly in what kind of tasks people are doing within these occupations. And for Germany, we see that this is uh, about one third, uh, it was predicted it's about one third of the occupations. Um, a lesser number of occupations are endangered by automatization, but hence will or are able to be replaced by machines. So our perspective, uh, what, we, what we wanted to do is we wanted to look at the task and we want to describe how this task are changing and which impact this might have for us, our um, humane um, work design. Uh, in our interdisciplinary research group, we identified four different groups of tasks, which we, we looked into more detail. And the first group are person-related tasks. These are interactive tasks when you work with or on people, like most prominently in uh, the health sector. The second group of tasks are information-related tasks tasks where you work with information and knowledge. These are tasks typically done in offices. The third group are product related tasks. And this is like the typical production industry, but also comprises tasks like cleaning or transporting goods. And finally, um, and we look at this in, 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 a special, uh, in a special group, is uh, the task of leading and managing. And it kind of surprised me as well, but we looked into a few different representative ser surveys, but because one, uh, up, up to one third of the German um, employees um, do a significant amount of leading and managing within their, within their job. It's not all on with the, the big teams they are leading, but they lead different work groups or projects and they, they conduct the task of leading and managing. So when we comprise this, uh, our, our approach is that um, within the, the work system, we uh, in the center of the work system and our, our perspective is the task. And the task is changing by the use of digital tools by different human beings. So this is our approach. Uh, what we did is we did a very comprehensive expert hearing. We talked to about uh, up to 50 different experts and we summarized um, the, 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 their um, expertise in uh, 14 criteria to design um, work in the digital area. And some of you, and especially if you come from the work psychology, um, might recognize some of the criteria. For example, the um, three criteria in the light gray, holistic work design, the diversity of requirements or time elasticity are well-established criteria also before the digital age. And we found that our experts um, told us that these criteria um, are still valid in the digital age and they're they don't lose in importance, but they also are not really changing. They are fully still um, valid. Then we identified three criteria, criteria which were also um, old or established criteria. These are the criteria opportunities for interaction or the appropriate scope of job control or also work integrated learning in order to create um, human work design. And what we found here is that these um, criteria um, are not new, but they kind of uh, are changing within the digital age. For example, work integrated learning, people not only have to have to learn um, uh, and in their job, but they also have to learn how to use digital tools. And this kind of interacts, for example, with the criteria of time elasticity, the, the people have enough time to do this uh, integrated learning during their job. 
And finally, we identified seven work criteria, work design uh, criteria, which are um, new um, or which occur during the digital transformation. And these criteria not only work on the on the task level, but also on other levels. For example, on the contextual level, that um, um, especially in digital area, um, one has to look into inclusiveness or the consideration of individuality and diversity um, much more. Or on the organizational, on the technical subsistence level, um, the criteria of the reliability of technology. This is the whole discussion about techno stress um, um, in this criteria. Or also the fair evaluation of processes, who evaluates um, um, individuals, other individuals through platforms, or is it in, is it in technical tool which evaluates you, or is it always um, or does it uh, always has to be a person who does the last evaluation? Um, when we, um, so I said, like the debate was about industry 4.0 to work 4.0 and also about digitalization. And the most current debate kind of was changing through COVID because during COVID, like in other countries as well, teleworking became more present in the German uh, workforce. Um, before uh, telework, less than 20% of the German workforce was regularly working from home. This increased dramatically, and not only the number increased, now up to a half of the um, German employees regularly work from home, but it also increased in the amount which was work, which was uh, work, work from home. Before COVID, here numbers of the Bauer Working Time Survey from 2019, about uh, three, th three quarters of employees who worked from home worked from home one day or less a week. This dramatically changed in 2021, and also our newest numbers we are conducting right now show that um, the average uh, worker or, or teleworker now works much more than one day a week from home. It's more something between two and three days and up to four days in specific um, occupations. So we have a, a big bundle of projects which uh, look into telework and look how this changing or this like growing importance of telework in the, in, in the, in, in the, um, in the world of work um, change work design. And we ha here have a uh, approach uh, with three main topics, like a bundle of um, projects looks into the workplace, another works uh, looks at working tools, like for example, mobile tools. This is a working group which especially focuses on um, work from um, planes or trains uh, or somewhere else. And, um, a few uh, projects are looking at the work organization and how mobile or hybrid work from different um, um, places through digital um, technologies is organized. And um, during COVID, we did a big company survey, the big COVID study. We um, asked um, um, responsible um, persons of companies, head, uh, head of companies um, regularly about um, every to four to eight weeks, um, how they deal with COVID. And we also did a uh, focus on telework. And um, the most recent um, numbers showed us that the employees made very good, uh, employers made very good experiences with telework, especially those with, high, with, with big, uh, uh, of especially big companies with employees more than with more than 250 employees told us that about 11% of these employers rep only report negative impact on productivity. The vast majority says there is no negative impact on our productivity level. However, um, over half of these employers of the big um, companies um, told us about on onboarding problems. The same amount of, of employers said that um, the high amount of telework has a negative impact on the leader employee communication. And 70% of the employers report the negative impact on employee employee communication. 
And uh, why is this uh, important for us as, uh, from the perspective of OSH and humane work design? Um, it not only comprises um, new demands, but it also, and this is something we, um, uh, we found in a very big project and a big meta-analysis um, for uh, psychological risk at work, that social support from colleagues and supervisors is the, or is one, or is the key research in dealing with work-related stress. And in the following, um, we can even see that social support from colleagues um, was shown to reduce the risk of depression and burnout. And especially an employee-centered leadership um, is able to reduce effective symptoms, burnout, stress, and different other health complaints. However, and this is something we look into right now, um, Leading hyper teams comes with new demands also for the leaders. And as I said earlier uh, in my presentation, up to one third of, um, of the employees in Germany do leading tasks. So, um, so there's a big new com demands coming um, through and might, um, which might um, be a risk for well being at work. Um, Many companies are thinking about how to bring back their stuff to the offices, and they often think about how to design offices um, that people are willing to come back. And there's a uh, starting debate about the company as a social place also. And in our project, we not only asked how um, ergonomically right can these um, offices or these open offices be designed, but also how can they create it as a social place, as a place where people are integrated, as a place where people support each other. Well, uh, I only was told to talk about only about 15 minutes. So this is uh, my last thoughts about the most recent debate, because in my opinion, the debate in Germany kind of is shifting right now, or there's two debates which are kind of in um, merging. And it's, um, I summarize it from the digital to, to the sustainable transformation. And um, many questions arise how sustainability and the socio-ecological transformation can be um, supported by digital, um, by the digitalization and the technological transformation. And this on the one hand, um, 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 so uh, um, comprises questions asked about social sustainability and especially about, about equality. And in these terms, for example, about the digital divine, whether or not it was uh, widened through COVID and the, uh, the use of telework or whether or not it was um, narrowed. But also um, arises questions about economizing our resources and how different work designs, for example, telework might contribute to save those resources. And one big last question uh, or topic we discuss is how new work demands um, occur in the recycling economy. Um, for example, like um, dealing with dangerous goods or hazards. So uh, to let you the opportunity to ask some questions and get into a discussion, I hope I gave you a little, uh, a, a little, a little, um, interest in that and I thank you all very much for your attention. Uh, thank you very much uh, um, Anita. Um, we'll go straight on to Verena um, with your presentation and then we'll take the questions at the end. All right, uh, so first of all, hello everybody. Uh, thank you for tuning in today. And um, Anita actually made the perfect transition to my talk today um, because she talked about Industry 4.0 and the topic of today's session is the future of work. So I'm picking up right where she left off with the topic of Industry 5.0, looking a little bit into the future or rather a future as I would hope it would come to be sometime. Um, and the question of what do we need to achieve this kind of uh, vision of the future of Industry 5.0 and uh, what are the obstacles and what aren't we doing at the moment, which we should be doing. 
So uh, Anita has already talked about the four industrial revolutions, and I'm sure you already are familiar with this idea that there have been industrial revolutions in the past, and they have all been uh, triggered and very much driven by technological changes. So some new technologies came along and then humans had to adapt and work organizations uh, were uh, adapting and it was uh, almost always the technology that really determined uh, what the, the human and the work organization needed to do in terms of adaptation, always with a goal of being more productive, more efficient and so on. And this had some positive effects on human work, uh, but it also had some negative effects. So for example, if we look at the age of industry 4.0, which is the one we're supposedly in uh, right now, we know that the uh, amount of digital work that people are doing increases uh, in many areas of work. And it has been well, very well documented that there are many negative effects of digital work as, as we are implementing it today on occupational health. So we know that, you know, working long time with computers, especially without breaks, uh, there's a high risk of postural problems, digestion problems, eye problems, headaches, uh, numbness, tendonitis, and so on, but also psychological disorders such as sleep disorders, burnout, and depression. And in fact, in Germany, when we look at the uh, total number of work and capacity days, so the reasons why people are calling in sick from work, basically, we see that the biggest contributor um, and the biggest cause of incapacity days in Germany are still musculoskeletal diseases. And I say still because the mental illnesses are really on the rise. And it's exactly this development trend that is very concerning to many researchers, but also companies in Germany. So for example, if we look at the past 25 years and the development of the uh, people who are work incapacitated due to mental health diagnosis, such as stress and burnout, we see that these, this number of days has basically tripled over the past 25 years. So it's a really worrisome uh, trend for many of us. Now it's always difficult to speak of cause and effect, uh, but we can see many effects of this way that we use technologies in this industry 4.0 that are probably likely to contribute towards this, these psychological health problems and also physical health problems. And such effects include, for example, work intensification that we see with increasing digitalization in many places. Uh, also the dissolution of boundaries between work and private life. We see a new rise of digital tailorism with work forms such as click work and leadership forms such as algorithmic management. And alongside with that, we see this increase in various health problems and also an increase in labor shortages. And Anita has said with this before, uh, labor shortages in Germany are a big problem and concern. And of course, uh, labor shortages are not just due to health problems, they're also due to demographic changes. But of course, if many people are calling in sick, um, then this uh, labor shortage increases overall. So there is an increasing awareness that we need to change something about the way in which we use technologies and the way in which we uh, digitalize and automate uh, our work. And this is where the idea of industry 5.0 really comes in. There has been this um, seminal publication, which some of you may already be familiar with by the European Commission in 2021, who are not the first to use this term industry 5.0, but who really kicked off uh, this movement of industry 5.0. And this idea is that the Industry 5.0 really places the well being of the industry worker at the center of production processes. So we are demanding basically a shift from a technology driven, technology centered digitalization automation towards a more human centered digitalization and automation. And sustainability is really a key concept here. And sustainability not only refers to ecological sustainability, which probably most of us think about first when we hear this word sustainability, but it also refers to social sustainability. 
And this concept of social sustainability, again, has been around for quite some time, but it's really becoming more and more um, popular, especially within this Industry 5.0 movement. So sustain, uh, social sustainability focuses on the importance of anyone uh, directly or indirectly involved basically in work. And the aim is to create working conditions that help to uh, preserve and further develop an individual's working capacity, but also a society's employment potential. It's about creating uh, working conditions that are conducive to learning and health and to not only increase overall employability, but also the empowerment of uh, individual workers at the workplace. And in fact, if we look at the UN Sustainable Development Goals, which I'm sure many of you have seen before, you know that each country sort of defined those sustainable development goals within their own um, policies. And the sustainable development goals, of course, are also a big part of Germany's sustainability policy. And there are many SDGs that actually reflect this idea of social sustainability. Of course, the SDG 3, which focuses on health, but also those that focus on providing better educational opportunities and better opportunities for participation for everyone, um, increasing the compatibility of work and private life, increasing gender fairness and uh, participation of women, especially in leadership roles, making economic growth more inclusive, creating good and secure jobs, shaping new forms of digital work and securing high empl employment, fair wages, and uh, including uh, uh, people, uh, also people with handicap and all other kinds of people. So this is the basic idea of social sustainability. And there are already many goals in the German sustainability policy that address this idea of social sustainability. So now the question is, uh, where are we today in industry 4.0 in terms of social sustainability and what are the obstacles and what can we do in order to increase social sustainability? Well, if we look at workplaces today and the production industry, we see that many of them have been designed uh, in another era, basically, for a person that is prototypical for the so-called average human. Now, the question, of course, is if we look at the diversity of people uh, on this planet and the diversity of the workforce in Germany, who is actually this average human? So it's almost impossible to design things for an average average human, uh, we need to design for individuals uh, because the workforce is much more diverse uh, in Germany than it uh, used to be. And the demographic is changing in many uh, different, very important aspects. So for example, uh, there is uh, an increasing trend towards an aging workforce in Germany. So we have uh, currently a population of around 84 million people in Germany. You can see here we have a, a working population of around 50 million. And uh, the baby boomer generation is about to retire. And even if we look at most optimistic scenarios where we have a very high net uh, migration and also increasing fertility rates, we still see that the uh, number of people at working age to so up to 66 years is decreasing. And that means, of course, there is an increased labor shortage. And in order to fill this gap or address this gap, um, we need to think about ways to better include and support uh, older people at the workplace. We also know and see that uh, there are more women in the workforce, and there are many grassroots, but also political legislative initiative initiatives that aim to provide better opportunities for women to enter and stay in the workforce until retirement. And there's another trend which is hardly talked about, which is a trend of uh, obesity. So uh, as of uh, today, around two thirds of men and half of women in Germany are overweight, not obese, but overweight. And if we look at the development trend, we see that almost for all age groups, and if we included the children here, it would be even more obvious, um, this tendency towards overweight uh, is increasing in Germany as well. 
why is all of that important? Well, if we consider that work systems in the production industry right now are really not optimized for all of these groups, overweight people, women and people of color, older people, people with disabilities, or really just people working mostly with computers rather than primarily performing manual labor. We see that there are many health related risks and also accident related risks as a result of this uh, exclusion, basically. And Modern assistive technologies, including all the wonderful things we can do with AI, certainly have a potential to not only facilitate work, but also increase health for individuals. But right now, the way that we are approaching technology development and the introduction of technologies at the workplace, they simply rarely account for individual differences. And the result is, of course, that as we introduce more and more of these technologies in the workplace, we will create more opportunities for exclusion rather than create opportunities for inclusion. So the question, of course, is how do we get from this point where we are right now from industry 4.0, where we have many health related uh, problems and also satisfaction related problems as a result of the work design right now? How do we get to this uh, idea of industry 5.0, where we use uh, technologies in order to increase social sustainability and therefore also um, health and opportunities for inclusion? And uh, you are probably not surprised to learn that uh, it doesn't happen overnight. We can't just say, okay, now we're deciding everything will be uh, industry 5.0. We need to lay the groundwork right now in the present for this. So the quest, first question, of course, is to ask ourselves, what do we actually mean by human centered digitalization and technology use? And um, Anita has uh, presented a, a, a model. Um, we have simplified this uh, a little bit uh, more and uh, said for us, we define automation and digitalization as human friendly when technologies, first of all, facilitate performance of the work task rather than making it more difficult for us, which unfortunately right now is happening in many cases. When these technologies protect the health and safety of employees, when they promote individual well-being and also develop individual skills and abilities. And this is uh, easier said than done. So we have a number of uh, research initiatives and initiatives working with companies where we try to uh, create opportunities for this human friendly automa automation and digitalization approach. For example, um, around two years ago, we have founded the Human Factors Competence Center for Employment in Industry 4.0 in Aachen. And our goal of this competence center is really bringing researchers, technology developers, and companies together, promoting this human-centric uh, approach to uh, developing and implementing Industry 4.0 technologies with a special focus on AI-based applications. And from our experience, we found that the biggest problem was really that many companies just couldn't imagine ways of human-centered digitalization and automation. Everybody's always so focused on using automation in order to automate processes and make them more and more effective. And it's hard to even just come up with examples of how we might take a different approach to this and still meet um, all of the requirements that you need uh, in a company, just from an economic point of view. So we are looking at different um, case studies, different examples where we are doing research uh, and also working together with companies. For example, we are doing research on the mentally healthy use of digital technologies and companies. We are looking at how we can use augmented reality and virtual reality for the ergonomic workplace design and assessment. We look at how we can think about material flow simulation differently by including human related aspects um, rather than just process related uh, focused aspects. And we also uh, do research on uh, finding a different approach to algorithmic management than the one that is popular right now and developing more of a human-centered algorithmic management approach. So just as an 
as an example, I just want to uh, talk a little bit about our research on the mentally healthy use of digital technologies and how we try to incorporate this individual uh, perspective or taking individual differences into account. So, uh, for example, we're doing a lot of research on work interruptions. Work interruptions is a big uh, area of research. Many have been conducting research on this, especially work interruptions that are due to digital technologies. Um, and they are among the most common stressors in the workplace and have doubled in the past 20 years in Germany. And now you might say, why is there so much of a research need? Obviously, you know, we just need to reduce the number of interruptions at the workplace and you don't need research for that, right? But actually, it's uh, much more complicated because work interruptions can also have beneficial effects. So, uh, for example, if you are working with very difficult tasks or tasks that are emotionally strenuous, then you might be quite happy um, to have a little bit of an interruption. So, in fact, it's not the frequency of the work interruptions, but our perception of these work interruptions that then has a either positive or negative effect on the perceived workload and on our perceived well-being. So we are basically investigating what are the characteristics of this interruption, basically what differentiates a good interruption from a bad interruption, uh, and then with the idea of deriving implications for the development and the use of digital technologies. So where does this individual difference perspective come in? Well, we're not looking at uh, just causal, directly causal relationships, but we are investigating moderator and mediator variables. So those variables that moderate or mediate the effect of the frequency of work interruptions onto uh, our uh, perception and then the effects of these uh, perceived interruptions. So we look at the type of interruption. For example, does an interruption come from an email or a chat? We look at the content. Is it work related or not? We look at different workplace factors. So have I been working on a complicated task when the interruption came in? And we also a look at individual factors such as age and gender and technology affinity and others. And we have done studies with several hundreds of um, office workers looking at these different factors. And we're still in the process of analyzing um, the data. And you can see here some references to publications that um, have just come out and are in the process of coming out in the next uh, weeks and months. Um, but the what we find in our data so far is it's really a complicated picture that these data are drawing. It's not as easy as saying uh, just reducing the number of work interruptions leads to better well-being. And it's you can't just easily say it's a certain number of, or a certain group of people that are more affected uh, by this than an, another group of people. We find very complicated interactions, which just points towards the importance, again, of considering uh, individual differences in combination with work factors. So in order to take individual differences into account and really design work specifically for individuals that have different characteristics, we need data about these people. We need data about workers at the workplace. And uh, this is a a topic that we are concerned with in a different research initiative of ours called the Internet of Production, where we are thinking about the industry of the future, and we are imagining that there will still be people working in the factory of the future. Um, but most of these people will be doing some kind of work with other technologies in some form. And that means that we have a lot of data on human machine interactions. And we are also making the assumptions that there may be other senses in the environment which will give us more data about humans and human uh, work and the different work activities. So we are uh, looking at how we can collate different data into what we call a human digital shadow. So a collection of different data that give us a better idea 
on individual differences of the human and give us more opportunity to adapt work systems specifically to different individuals. So such a human digital shadow can contain, for example, some, as we call it, stable data on body dimension, handedness, and so on, in order to provide a better ergonomic workplace design. Also long-term data of the history of work, working tasks, how long have people been working uh, on a specific task or under specific conditions, for example, noisy conditions, and what might be the accumulated load of risk exposure of these workers at work, which, as you can imagine, is an important foundation for an individual-specific health management. And uh, it might also include situational data, such as the current working schedule or physiological measures that can then help us to adapt the system response of a working system that people are working with, for example, adapting the work speed or information density or offering different micro breaks, depending on the current state of a worker. So we are currently investigating uh, just an example of this with uh, human automation interactions in a process control settings where people are performing different monitoring tasks and use psychophysiological measures to assess the operator's mental state, aiming to predict a human's um, state of uh, mental workload, or how uh, what their momentary ability is to cope with different task demands, and then implementing uh, adaptation in this technology in order to account for this uh, workload of the individual. Now, if you think about you know, collecting lots and lots of data of employees, you might be thinking, oh, I can see some concerns with that. And that's, of course, something that we are concerned with as well. There are many ethical, legal, and social implications associated with the collection of uh, individual specific data. And uh, of course, we want to be very mindful of this and also investigate this and consider this before we implement such technologies uh, in the workplace. And we've seen in our studies that employers, especially as employees, see some benefits of such technologies. But of course, there are also many uh, privacy concerns that are a central barrier that uh, need to lead us to rethink uh, the amount of data that needs to be shared and also think about data anonymization concepts so that um, data can be collected without uh, ever harming uh, individual employees. So when we think about human-centric technology research and development, we say we need to think of four basic uh, foundational principles. First of all, we need to develop technologies that support physical as well as psychological health at the workplace. We need to develop technologies that help every person to perform work to the best of their abilities, considering differences in age, gender, ethnic background, physical constitution, and many other areas. We also need to develop technologies that enable on-the-job training and lifelong learning at work and, of course, uh, consider ethical, legal and social aspects in the development and also in the deployment of such technologies. So much for human-centered technology development, uh, but at the end of the day, technology development induces only one aspect of work design. And of course, uh, if we think about human-centric work design, uh, we need to think about many more aspects, not just the individual worker and how that worker works with the technology with a specific work task. But as we all know, uh, work design can uh, also affects many other layers, not just the individual, but also the group in which people are working, uh, leadership um, styles, uh, the uh, company itself, and also on a supra company level, there are issues to consider when it comes to human centric uh, work design, for example, of course, the impact on the environment and the ecology and also laws and standards that are associated with the use of technologies. So in conclusion, to wrap this up, and so you have some more time to ask questions, I can uh, just uh, say that uh, in summary, our current technology-centered approach to digitalization automation, automation, as you've seen, increases really mental health-related risks as well as labor shortages, and this is a huge concern uh, in Germany. 
And therefore, the vision of Industry 5.0 really calls for this paradigm shift from a technology center to human centered development of new technologies, but also of a use of technologies in order to increase the social sustainability, which aims at providing both health as well as learning conducive working conditions for all workers. In order to promote long term social sustainability at work, we need to think about developing technologies with the goal of promoting health and participation and learning, but also thinking about ethical, legal and social implications from the start uh, of the technology development process. And finally, of course, we need to keep in mind that socially sustainable work design also requires a very systematic consideration of the effects of technologies on the individual and the group company and super company level. And it's not enough to just provide many individual pieces of research, although we still need all of those uh, little pieces of research in order to get a better overall picture. But we also need urgently very systematic approaches in in order to really coordinate our efforts and gain greater understanding on how we can actually pave this way from an industry for very technology centered um, industry to a technology five point uh, or to a uh, industry 5.0 where the human stands in the center and of course I hope that we will be making a lot of progress and that this idea of industry 5.0 will be catching on in Germany and abroad. So with that, I thank you very much for your attention and uh, we still have some time for questions. I'm happy to answer those questions if you have any for me. Thank you. Um, thank you very much to both uh, Anita and Verena. Um, I've, I've got copious amounts of pages of notes, uh, which I made, so, th so thank you very much for that. Um, but this isn't about me, it's about uh, the, the participants in, in the process too. And, uh, Got a couple of questions coming through. If anyone else has got a, got questions, please feel free to post them in the, the Q&A. Um, the first one is from uh, Rosemary Siever. Uh, the question's specifically for Anita, but uh, Verena, I think if you've got an answer, feel free to answer too. Um, so the question is about, with the rise of the number of people who are, who are teleworking uh, and many office spaces not being used, how do you think we can make better use of that office space which many companies have bought or built uh, and still retain productivity levels or, or socialization. Yeah, thank you very much. I think this is the core of the debate right now, actually. Um, as for Germany, um, somehow surprisingly, but not if you, if you know the German companies, for a long time, the companies were very conservative about giving up office space. But in my opinion, uh, they started to change their mindset a little bit right now, and they're making, um, um, they, 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 they think up a lot about how to design and how also like minimize their work offices, because of course, this is something which is economically um, nonsense, the whole like uh, empty, um, empty offices. Um, um, but um, interestingly, like all the studies I uh, read and we, we bring together in our reviews right now, kind of like hint on that, what we already know from um, the design of open offices for like 20 years. Um, like when when you when you um, apply an activity based approach on on the de design of um, offices, you don't really save that much space because you have uh, you have spaces for different activities. You need to uh, like I think it is. Um, um, the wrong path if you if you if you think about people only come to the office to communicate to work creative with each other you also need places where people can think in privacy have their have their have their space can concentrate because not everybody has this place at home and not everybody is able to do that at home so um, I think um, what we suggest and what we what we're working on also with companies together is like create um, activity activity-based um, offices. And there's not a one fit all um, um, solution, I think. I think every um, company and especially also the teams, they have to be involved in creating these this, um, this offices in order to fit the design of the office to the activity of the different teams working in the offices. Um, thanks. thanks very much, Anita. Verena, do you want to add to that or? Uh... Um, I mean, I I've, think, 
<laughs> yeah. We can nah. discuss this <laughs> for a long time, office spaces. Maybe just uh, one thing I would like to add, uh, which is that um, in Germany, oftentimes there's been this suggestion that uh, working from home increases work-life balance. And I think uh, this is a question uh, or a discussion that needs to be um, carefully considered because of course we also know and we've seen in the COVID area that uh, for many uh, women, this has not been um, ideal because of course, if you have to, and Many men have made this experience as well. If you have to watch your children at the same time as working, this is not ideal. So it's not uh, as easy as saying uh, you, you can work from home and then you have a better work-life uh, balance. But as Anita has said, you know, companies need to really think about how they can provide um, the best office space opportunities for the workers and the type of work that they need to be doing. Yeah, yeah, I support it fully and especially also for before COVID, um, our studies, but as well others also showed that it is more the time you save uh, from um, from, com from communicating between um, office and home um, by teleworking than really, um, yeah, uh, giving a more work-life balance. And I think um, th there, there's this really good book by He Jung um, about the flexibility paradox, which uh, she especially gives this argument that that more flexibility does not mean a better work-life balance. And I also always tell this in my speeches, I say, even if I have um, the opportunity to combine family and work life, it doesn't really mean that I have a good balance of it. Thank you. Um, I think there's, uh, there's uh, and I agree, I agree with you wholeheartedly on both those points. Um, there's, there's two questions here from, from Marina. I think they're both for, uh, for Verena. Um, the, the one is, I think, relating to your model about how you would collect the individualized data, and that is some examples about how you might create, collect some of the psychophysiological data in production environments. So you're talking about wearable surveys, workload assessments. Um, yes. Yeah, so uh, maybe just answer that one, yeah. Yes, all, all of the above. Uh, we're looking at how can we collect as many data as possible, but with the idea of uh, not having the necessity to use everything later on, but just identifying the best, uh, you know, best uh, options of collecting a data. So for uh, workload assessment, uh, for example, we're looking at, uh, we're using eye tracking to use the index of cognitive activity, which is not ideal, but it's sort of the best thing that we have uh, right now. We look at how reliable this sort of uh, measurement is using eye tracking. We also uh, use a heart rate variability in combination with eye tracking. So there are many different options which you can use, uh, but the aim should be not to use all of them, um, but to find those indicators that are the best and at the same time also have the least uh, amount of risks uh, for uh, workers when you collect individual data. I think that last point is probably the most useful. This one, not just just because we have it doesn't necessarily mean we should use it, but what's appropriate for the works that's being done. That's exactly. a good point. Um, there's a, uh, a question here from from Teresa. I'm not sure who'd be able to best give an answer for this this one, but uh, Teresa asks, do you think, at least in the short term, whether this digital transformation of work that's happening at the moment will exclude the older workers? I don't know, Anita, if you want to take that or maybe I'll just have a briefly just my take on this. Um, I think it's a, a misconception and there are some, stu some studies that have shown this, that it's not necessarily older people who are uh, uh, not fit to work with digital technologies or who are um, uh, have anxiety about working with digital technologies. So it's not as easy as saying there's sort of an age um, directly associated, uh, but it's more about technology affinity and uh, whether you know people have been using technologies uh, in the past, regardless of their age, and also what are the you know, consequences that they feel uh, uh, can uh, occur as a result of using this technology. So if you are scared that you know, something bad can happen if you use the technology, you raise all kinds of company data by accident or things like that, then uh, you are more likely to um, uh, be anxious when you're using um, technologies. And this may apply to younger people as well as older people. <laughs> so yeah, so maybe I can add there. Said my my work-life balance is being... Uh, being interrupted by my cat at the moment. Um, <laughs> so uh, 
I'm just going to, uh, there's, a, there's a couple of questions uh, that have come from both Marina and Teresa. I'll get to those now because uh, we're just about run out of time. Uh, but I want to give someone else a chance. Uh, so I know it was only just posted now, but someone called Monere Fatai has just posted a comment which says, uh, there are a lot of workers, especially in developing and less developing countries that are less educated or not educated at all in some instances. Uh, we cannot just pick educated as, as uh, workers, but how do we prepare these workers to handle these new technologies? Especially, I, I think, uh, Anita, it was in your presentation where you were talking about one of those graphs talking about for Germany to remain competitive, it needs actually a higher rate of, of net immigration. Um, maybe you try to answer uh, that question. I'm not sure if I get this question. It's like you want to prepare those uh, people for the German labor market? I think so, yes. Uh, yeah. Okay. Well, education is still the key. I think um, you you need to you need to get them educated. And um, um, yeah, well, I think the era of uh, of telework not only is uh, in the in the workplace but it's also in the education and i think it is more um, it becomes more and more easy to uh, on an international level um, um, yeah gain compet competences and um, knowledge about technologies and it's easier you don't have to fly to germany to the us or to, to europe in order to to be trained like many things are um, available online and I think we should use them and in order to learn from each other and not only in one direction but also in the other direction to learn how others uh, which are which are the obstacles in other countries in order to better prepare to work together internationally. Thank you, thank you Anita. Um, here's a question for, for uh, Verena, I know we're a little bit over time so please to tell me to tell me to stop, uh, there's only a couple more questions. Verena, um, how has the introduction of technologies like uh, cobots uh, been accepted um, or experienced by older workers and, and those who have uh, highly technical or hands-on skills? Yeah, this is a very interesting uh, topic. We've done some uh, studies on this. And uh, one thing that's um, um, investigated quite a bit is this idea that workers are afraid they're being replaced by um, cobots. Um, so uh, the idea that uh, robots are maybe helping me today, but then tomorrow they can do my work. And in fact, uh, only a few studies have uh, shown evidence for this because most people actually think that they themselves cannot be replaced, but they are scared or they have this concern Concerned that other people may be replaced in the future by robots. So this is a very, very interesting sort of distinction that you can see in many types of uh, research, and we found this in our uh, research as well. But um, just anecdotally, uh, we've um, had some research projects with some companies who have uh, said quite a few that um, their cobots are being sabotaged quite a bit by workers. So this is actually quite a bit of a problem, uh, and we don't actually quite know why there has been this uh, theory that maybe they are afraid they would be replaced but my theory is because they just have very poor usability uh, so my answer would be uh, the experience um, is good with cobots if you know usability is good if people can actually work with these technologies and as with anything with any kind of technology if the usability is poor then you have a poor experience and then uh, acceptance is uh, poor of these technologies as well and this also applies to cobots yeah, I, I think you're. I think you're quite right. Um, all right, let one one last question, and then I can let you both go. Um, and uh, this is a question, another question from Teresa. Uh, so, what are the main competencies of work that workers will need to better cope with new technologies and AI? I'm assuming you mean artificial intelligence and in workplace workplaces in the future. Um, so, especially as the way in which we see work might become more opaque. We can't actually see the work processes. So how do we prepare, I suppose, or what are the competencies that workers of the future will need? I think the competencies are very broad and uh, very specific. And I think which is maybe more important than specific knowledge is to give order to plan time in order to, ad um, to, to adapt new um, knowledge to, to get to know how, um, how new technologies work. 
And um, for, we saw this in, in, in our data that especially in the production sector where like big new machines are implemented, um, um, employees um, are promoted with time. They, they get um, classes and they, they are trained on the new machine. But especially in the service sector, um, individuals and employees on and on get new updates of software, of new tools and of new mobile devices, but no time to learn how to deal with those. And I think the, maybe in order to do a good work design, you should um, plan time in training on new technologies. Good point. Yeah, good point. Well, um, I'm aware we're, we're over time and we try to keep it uh, fairly tight because we know that not just our speakers, this is valuable time for our speakers. We talked about work interruptions. I don't know if this is a positive or a negative work interruption. I'm hoping it was a positive work interruption. Um, and uh, But just to thank uh, both Anita and Verena for your very insightful comments and inputs on and your take on, on, on the future of work. Uh, very much appreciate that. And thanks also to our audience who have uh, made the time to be here. Um, so thank you very much. Uh, the recording, if you want to go over any of the pieces uh, again and have a look at stuff, uh, we will have the recording available probably tomorrow um, on our I, uh, IEA International Ergonomics Association YouTube channel. Um, and so look out, if you don't know what that is, uh, either drop me an email or alternatively look out in your news briefs. Um, it'll give some information on that. So thank you very much to everyone. I see there's some Thank thanks as well discussion. coming through from if uh, Verena and uh, Anita, if you look, there's also some thanks coming through uh, from uh, from people in the chat too. So uh, for your input, this was a really insightful and really enjoyed it. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much.